I'm your host, George Lewis. We're in for a great night. I've got a, I've got a really good guest. I know you're going to enjoy him. Before I tell you about tonight's guest, let me talk with you a little bit about next week's guest. I've got Steve McAllister. Steve wrote a book called The McAllister Code. It's an interesting novel about aliens and spirituality and, believe it or not, about marketing. So quite a mix. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Be sure and tune in next week. My guest tonight uh, is, well, before I go there, let me tell you about the Spiritual Broadcasting Network. You know, most of us who are spiritual but not religious uh, believe that there's a transformation, uh, a, a transformative revolution, really spiritual revolution in process. And those of us who are awake and attuned to that are really, you know, working at helping to bring that about through personal change and through uh, talking with others. And the spiritual but not religious community really doesn't have any central place, uh, no communities that really come together. Where I, I believe there are really millions of us out there at this point. As a matter of fact, I just was uh, contacted by a paper or newspaper up in New Jersey. Uh, that they're doing a big article up there from Gannett uh, News, and they want to know about the spiritual but religious community. So it's you know it's the kind of thing where we're starting to get some attention. You look at CBN and the Jewish Network, they all have their, their, their place where voices can be heard, but our community, the spiritual but not religious community, doesn't. And so that's what Spiritual Broadcasting Network is about. We'll be bringing you the many, many diverse voices of that spiritual community and be trying to do our part in bringing some change to the world, which really needs it at this point before we really destroy our planet and ourselves. My guest tonight is Mark Duquette. Mark wrote a book called Orange, Sh Orange Sunshine, How I Almost Survived America's Cultural Revolution. <coughs> Excuse me. For those of you who were around in the 60s and the early 70s, you may have heard of Orange Sunshine, and we'll talk a bit about what that's all about. Tom, we have, uh, we have Mark, Mark Duquette on the phone. Good evening, Mark. Are you with me? Hello, Mark. Did you you push the button over there, Tom? Yeah, I have. It's not coming up. Oh, my goodness. All right. N no, no luck? Mark, he's, he's gone. All right, I'll, get, I'll go ahead and take him Tell up. you what, we have, we have lost uh, Mark. Mark uh, uh, somehow or other took a dive. Oh, there he It's probably him calling in now. Good evening. It's not rolling over. It isn't. What line are you calling in on? The correct one? On the right line, yeah. You're there, Mark, right? Hmm. Boy, well, I'm sorry. We've got we've got some kind of difficulty there, going on. Do we, we got him. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, uh, Mark, are you there? I'm here. I'm you here. know, I, I kind of overheard your and Tom's conversation earlier talking about some of the difficulties that we have with some of the people that, uh, you know, some of the spiritual stuff we do gets a little far out there. I, I don't know. What kind of karma are you bringing with you tonight? Well, I, <laughs> I, I wrote our conversation with, with Tom, I was, I was just going to say I'm, I'm not bringing in any dark spirits or anything today. Not, not from what I've... Not to my knowledge. <laughs> no. Hey, I want you to know, I just thoroughly enjoyed your book. Oh, well, thank you, George. Absolutely. And your stories, you're a great storyteller. Thank uh, you. And we don't, although we don't sell books, I really recommend, you know, that the folks out there uh, pick your book up. Uh, they have a really enjoyable, enjoyable read. So, uh, you know, before we get started, well, you know what? Usually I'll have a guest uh, give me a little bit about their background. But we're going to be talking about your background all evening here, sure, so, yeah. so I, I think I think we'll just pass on that. You know, in the '60s and '70s, um, what the question I had, what, you know, I have a lot of them, but the the the, the main one I had was, <laughs> judging from uh, how much I laughed, uh, were you actually subversive or were you just having a good time, or were? You... No, I was. I was actually. I actually believed. Uh, with most of my mind, I, I believed in the, 
in, in the subversive path I was I was following. Right, which was a pretty is a pretty interesting path. Yeah, it it progressed uh, it progressed from uh, you know from the Vietnam veterans against the war to the Cuban based yeah. Santa Ramos Brigade and. And it just kept getting farther and farther, more radical and more radical. And well, mo- t- most of my mind accepted it, but the higher part of my mind didn't. I hear you. Well, let's, let's before we get into that, let's let's kind of uh, go back a little bit, uh, quite a bit, really. You <laughs> you make a very interesting statement early on, and that uh, was that you were born in a blackout. Right. Tell tell us about that. Well, I was, I was born in Long Beach, California during uh, during World War II, and at that time, Long Beach was a, was a, a for one thing, it was a big naval center. Still is, and, isn't it? And it was also a, a center of uh, oil fields, refineries, drilling, and, uh, and oil production. There had been some uh, attacks from Japanese submarines uh, during the very early part of the war. I know they hit, they hit a couple of uh, oil facilities in Santa Barbara. Most people don't know about that. Right. And uh, and so we were uh, kind of scared of, of uh, you know, of Japanese invasion. They, they just hit Pearl Harbor, and, and, and I was born in uh, about six months after that. So at night, they, they made everybody uh, turn their lights out, uh, made the, you know, people drive with just their fog lights on, and uh, and everyone had blackout curtains so that right. you could leave your lights on in the house or the hospitals and and uh, but everybody uh, drew their blackout curtains down so, so it was uh, so that 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 uh, was kind of significant in that it was a kind of an uncanny premonition of the future huh right and and yeah and they did power down too so so I know my when my mom went to the hospital in the cab, they were they were driving you know in a blackout on blacked out streets, and, <laughs> and it was it was kind of surreal, you know. She said, "I was born, I guess, about six months after you in Cheyenne, Wyoming, at an army base there uh, oh, in Cheyenne." Oh. So I, I had a little taste of that, that that kind of stuff myself. Right. I think my thing wasn't a blackout though. I think what happened was they put my bare bottom up to that February weather in Cheyenne and. And uh, then about six months later, I hit Florida, and Florida was like, has been my cosmic home ever since, even though I was raised in Michigan. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yeah. So, so you you were you were a, a Mason at some point, were, were you not? Are you still a Mason? I well, I don't pay my dues anymore. I kind of dr- just dropped out of it, but not because I uh, found any fault with it. Right. Um, yeah, I became a I became a Mason as soon as I turned 21 in Columbus, Nebraska. I I joined up and and uh, you know went through the the what they call the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees. Right. And uh, and then I as I became political, um, you know, at at that time in that part of the country, at least uh, the lodges were segregated. There were white lodges. Right. You know, who had American Indians and or Native Indians and and uh, and other people, but they didn't they didn't have any African Americans in in the lodges. So there were there were African American lodges that were separate, and then there were white lodges. And so that uh, uh, I got on my high horse about that and uh, and dropped out. So well, yeah, and you know, I I was a D uh, a little earlier mm-hmm. than that, and, and which was you know. Uh, Kind of a predecessor, or a prelude to Masonic work. But I never, mm-hmm. I never really got into Masons. My whole family was. Mm-hmm. By the way, does the name John Sinclair? Uh, you recall that name? No. Well, John was a member of the Black Panthers, and I went to school with John. He, him, and his wife or his sister Kathy. Mm-hmm. So, so anyhow, you you had a uh, quite an ex- uh, an experience out in the desert that uh, that you talk about. How about giving us a you you re, you recall that in the book? I sure do. That was yeah. That was one of the turning points in my life. It looked like a big turning point to me. Yeah, it was. It it really was. This this was um, February, nineteen sixty seven. Um, my brother and I, uh, we were just starting to experiment with LSD, and uh, somebody had given us a, a thousand 
might have, which was which is quite a pretty quite good a dose. High dose. Yeah. yeah. And we decided that we'd go out into Joshua Tree National Monument and uh, and we'd split that thousand mic tab and and we'd watch the sun come up. And so when we when we did that, we had all kinds of revelations that uh, you know, like I had before then, before February of of 1967, I I never even understood what anybody was talking about when they talked about reincarnation, right, or, or karma, or uh, uh, yoga. I never meditation. None of these words. I was a biker, and uh, and none of these these words were all unfamiliar to me. And these these words and these concepts just flooded into my mind out there in the desert as the as the sun was coming up opposite a full moon. Well, you said you were you were you were you were, you were a, a a biker. You, I believe you you had a Norton that you chopped and put into a, a racing BMW frame. That's right. Th- this was in uh, in '66. Right. I I bought a a Norton 750 Norton, and I I put the uh, Norton engine into a chopped BSA racing frame, and it was a beautiful bike. Oh, I'm it, sure it was. Just a beautiful street rod. <laughs> Caught caught my attention. I'm, I I I've ridden bikes, you know, pretty much my whole life. I, matter of fact, I had a, uh, an accident, and got blinded in my left eye about 30 years ago, and uh, but I, oh. st- but I still. You, you could identify with my my chapter on motorcycle down. Oh, t- t- totally. I, oh. I, listen, uh, you, <laughs> I, I would like to you know sit around and drink some coffee with you. Right, right, exactly. You, you know, you get here to Florida, or I get out there. I'm going to definitely look you up. We'll, you got we'll, it. We'll definitely do that because you will. You're a good guy. I can I can tell by uh, I listened to some of your interviews and read your book and uh, you know quite a, quite a path that, that you've led. How did you happen to come by reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead by the time you were in the eighth grade? I had a um, a friend when we were in third third grade. Uh, a friend of mine, a kid I went to school with, he was he was would been like what we would call now like a super nerd, <laughs> and I was just kind of a semi nerd. Right. And so I he wanted to make a a uh, a replica of King Tut's tomb out of balsa wood. And then we were going to enter it at the Long Beach Hobby Show. Ah. And so we went to a, there was a old bookstore in downtown Long Beach called Acres of Books. And it was really, it was a, a landmark. It, it was quite a place. You had to light your way through the dark, musty shelves. It was, it was sounds, wonderful. Sounds wonderful to me. Yeah, yeah. it was. And, and so we were getting all kinds of books on on Egypt, anything we could find on King Tut. So th- this is, a, so we're talking 1950. Right. You know, so there wasn't much going on in, the, in people's consciousness about Egypt, King Tut, you know, any, anything like this. It was, it was pretty esoteric at that time, but we were, we were into it. So that, that's probably, you know, comes from what we call past on scar, as I imagine we probably... We were probably uh, lived back then in in another life or something. But Egyptian Book of the Dead was one of the one of the books that we we picked up there at Acres of Books. And I tried to read it, and I could, I didn't make any sense out of it at all. Well, oh, I but, wondered about that. No, no, that's no. Like... I, you know, I was just trying to I was just trying to look like I was smarter than I was. You know walking around with it well, well you know something mark I, I wonder you know i've read things that i you know that were so esoteric i really i really couldn't grasp it when i was reading it but something happens you know and that stuff starts to gurgle around inside of you and it bubbles up somewhere later on down the road you know mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's, it's interesting how that works yeah it, and it it probably does it just probably goes back into the into the brain someplace and, and just starts working you know it, it downloads maybe it takes 20 years to download I, I, well I think I think you're right especially with the <laughs> so, you know I'm not exactly the quickest uh, on the uptake but 
I've spent a lot of years uh, doing the same thing, very similar things to what you've done. It looks to me like you've been following a spiritual path for you know for most of your life, uh, even though the drugs and alcohol were there. Which I, you know, I don't. I'm not sure that those are a block uh, to this quest for spirituality. They may even be. They may even push us into that higher spirituality or death, one or the other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, Carl Jung said that in, that, in a letter to Bill Wilson that uh, I think it, what, the way he termed it was spiritus contra spiritum, which was, you know, the, the, the uh, spiritus, the, the, the highest de- deprivation in, in spiritum, the, uh, the highest in spiritual uh, work, which was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and many recovering alcoholics, uh, most of the recovering alcoholics and addicts I know are, are very spiritual people. I, I think, you know, one of the things they talk about alcohol and, in, you know, in my training as a counselor, it, you know, we would hear uh, definitions like yeah, it's the universal solvent that dissolves the invisible barriers between me and the rest of the world. Absolutely. So we were searching for unity. We were searching for, you know, a, a merging, a sense of oneness. And I think, you know, we were going about it, you know, on, if there's a left-hand path, you know, we were taking the left-hand path trying to get to God, I think. Well, why, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's like that, that seeking of that peak experience, you know, you, you have to eventually come to God because none of them are going to keep you satisfied for long. Yeah, yeah, it's a God-sized hole we talk about, and, you know. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So, so the, you, you have a thing on the big I in your book. Tell, tell us that story. Well, the, this happened... Shortly after my brother and I returned from from the desert, all all hollow-eyed and and saintly, uh, <laughs> I, I decided. I, I got a real visual on that <laughs> yeah, one. <laughs> I, I, got, I, I I saw that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I took another high dose of something else, you know, another type of LSD. It wasn't the it wasn't that thousand mic tab. I think it was a. You know, it was uh, 300 mics, and uh, and I took it alone, and I was sitting in my chair, and uh, and I saw as, as it started to the uh, as the drug started to come on, you know, you, you get this feeling in your spine, and and I get a kind of a metallic taste in my mouth, and I know, oh my God, you know, here it comes, and. Uh, and I, I was looking around the apartment, and I was seeing all the visual things that I usually see. The, you know, the walls were breathing, and the, and the draperies had become organ pipes filled with purple <laughs> fluid. And, right. You know, the cottage cheese ceiling was doing its thing. <laughs> and I, I looked down at, the, at myself sitting in the chair, and I saw myself break down into my atomic structure i saw i saw myself turn into just like points of light atoms and molecules in vibration and then i saw i saw the chair do the same thing and then and then the the whole apartment and i just kept expanding out and the the city of costa mesa was was just all you know light light and in uh, in vibration and and I just kept backing up and backing up and expanding until I saw that the the Earth and the solar system were, you know, like a molecular structure of its own, the galaxy. And I just kept backing up and backing up, uh, expanding further. And then it all, it all, all the galaxies and universes, it all formed a giant eye. And... Then I, I remember thinking, with, with what little logical thought I had left, because when you you know when you're peaking, you're, there's not much. <laughs> you, you don't think in words anymore. No, no. And and I thought, yeah, if I expand one more notch back, I'm going to see whose whose face uh, 
the I is, is, is resides in. Right. And, and I backed up that notch, and it was myself. And I saw my own face. And so I immediately got this the concept of the microcosm and the macrocosm, and those, and those words came into my head. Now I'm, you know, I'm still my my motorcycle boots, my chains, my guns, my knives. <laughs> they're all sitting around, laying around the apartment, and I'm and I'm experiencing the microcosm and the macrocosm. Never read a book on on anything like this. And I thought, oh, we are all one. The, you know, the mystics are right. You know, we we really are all one. And um, and after that experience, I started running around Costa Mesa preaching that we are all one. And we have to stop the war. And we, you know, and, and and then I could tell very very quickly that uh, people were thinking I was crazy. And and I backed off and and stopped and stopped preaching. Well, I think that's almost the only way we can get out of the uh, deep sleep that humanity seems to be in is to be crazy by that standard, you know, mm-hmm. in some ways. Not, not that we need to be out there, like, uh, being totally crazy. But, you know, no, that big I, eye you talk about, I I, I, I lead a, a meditation meeting. I've been doing it for about 10 years in, in uh, and, uh, an 11-step meditation. And... Uh, gee, we see that big eye on a pretty regular basis uh, in, you know, like during meditation, two or three of us sometimes at a time. It's mm-hmm. pretty interesting, pretty yeah. interesting stuff. That, uh, were you wearing sandals and the robe? And, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I talk about that. <laughs> you know, I, for, a, for a couple of days, I grabbed a staff and, and I didn't really have a, you know, a, a, a proper robe. But uh, I I did have some some sandals that I got at South Coast Plaza and made from buffaloes. I did buffalo, I think, and and I you know I walked around Costa Mesa for a while looking wild-eyed, and, you know, telling people they had to stop the war, and and that that was another thing I learned besides the you know the mystical experience or you know that I felt was a mystical experience. I also learned that. Uh, proselytizing isn't isn't really uh it's not part of the deal is not it? part of the deal no uh, no not no, at all. nobody you know a day before i had the experience of the big eye if someone would have tried to come up to me and tell me what i was trying to tell you know the regular citizens in costa mesa yeah it'd be right you know, <laughs> yeah I, who knows what i would have done i would have i would have wanted them away from me that's for sure absolutely yeah. well, well you know i don't i don't think the the real spirituality that we get connected to mark i don't think that can be taught from the pulpit i think that's passed one on one right and that and that the the uh, the title of your of your program uh, you know spiritual uh, you know spiritual but, not but, religious yes. or spirituality not religion right yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that religion destroys spirituality, and it's, uh, it's sad that happens. I mean, it does a lot of good, but it still, you know, it still, it still tends to do that. So you, you were at the, you, you were in some. One, let me tell you, one of the things I just really appreciate about you and about the way you write is that you, you really get some good humor into some very serious topics. You know, some stuff that we can really. Uh, and and it's it's refreshing. It's, I, I read a lot of a lot. Of, I've written a book myself, and it's just a. I, I, I'd like to be able to get the you know some of the humor into what I write that that you have here. It's, it's, it's I totally appreciated it. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell us about the, the your experience with that uh, the demonstration there at the Century Plaza Hotel on June twenty third. That was a pretty interesting thing. Yeah. This. This was June twenty third, nineteen seventy seven. Yeah, sixty seven, right? Yeah. Um, a lot uh, of people don't know what was going on in in, in in that time. You might give us give them a little brief. Uh, well, at that time, the the Vietnam War was was really starting to to turn sour. Yep. And and people thinking thinking people even even veterans themselves were were saying we're in a no-win war uh we're you know killing 
tens of thousands of our own guys, uh, you know, and uh, and for what? We're not we're we're weren't allowed to win the war, and uh, and so even the even the gung ho uh, soldiers and and Marines were were coming back. They were coming back from Vietnam, and they were joining organizations like the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and right. and of course the universities have always, you know, they were just, just this was perfect for them, and uh, you know, and they organized demonstrations, and and there it was a very volatile period. It almost it almost split the country in two. Sure did, didn't it? It really polarized. It really polarized things. And so President Johnson at that time was, uh, you know, he was the, the, that's where the buck stopped with, right. the, with the Vietnam War. And he was going to be uh, giving a speech at, at the Century Plaza Hotel in, uh, in Los Angeles. And my brother and I had heard that he was, he was going to be speaking. And so we went, we went to a, uh, an organizing meeting and and thought we might go to the demonstration afterward which was the, the following weekend so so we went to the meeting and the meeting was was very strange and you know it was it was um the extreme far left to people like my brother and I who just wanted the war to stop and and weren't all that political at that time. Right. We were we were more hippies than we were anything else. We we just you know we just thought you know killing all these Vietnamese and and destroying all this these forests and trees and jungles and it doesn't go with love, does it? Just, it? Yeah, it just wasn't good. Yeah. So my brother didn't go to the demonstration which was held the following Saturday, but I did. And the demonstration turned into a, what, we, what was termed a police riot. And what it had, there was 20,000 of us, and it, it started out very festive, and, and there were, you know, folk, songers, folk singers were singing folk songs and, and uh, you know, political speakers were speaking politically, and... And it was a it, people brought their kids, and it was it was a it was a festive occasion. And then the march started, and, you know, as a, kind of as the sun was going down, and we started marching toward uh, Century Plaza. And for some reason, the march stopped, and and I was kind of in the middle, so I I couldn't see what was going on in front, but I just knew we were stopped, and we were in a in a position where. We were kind of hemmed in, and then LAPD buses started to arrive, and, uh, and you know, and, and police unloaded their their men, and and they formed a line running parallel to our our march, and they wouldn't talk to us. We tried to we tried to communicate with them. You know, you man, what's happening, man? Right, right. What's happening, man? They already don't like you. Yeah, no, they already don't. Us. Yeah, yeah. No, and we didn't we didn't help that. But we were at least the the air what I could see was peaceful. Right. Nobody was throwing things, nobody was making remarks or anything in, in the area that I was a witness to. And and then on on some kind of a command, they just waded into us with their batons swinging and they just beat the crap out of us. And the the march, uh, you know, split up. People were people were screaming and and you know, falling down, and it was it was like something out of a movie. And and we when those of us who came in the same car, we all made it back to our car, and we were just we were devastated. We were shocked. It was oh we, man, we couldn't believe anything like this was happening in America. And, and so what happened, and I think how I end that chapter was, was 20,000 white liberals and hippies attended this, this march, and 20,000 committed radicals left. 
changed everything, didn't that it? That night, yeah. Yeah, what was the effect on you, and the pretty lasting effect, huh? Oh, yeah, I, it really, I could only see the small picture of, of what happened, and, and, uh, and I, just, I just wanted to bring the whole thing down. I think that was, that was kind of a turning point for me politically, where I just, I became, you know, pretty hard about, I just wanted, I wanted out, I didn't want to participate in the system anymore, and shortly after that, we all dropped out and moved up to Oregon and formed a commune in the, in the forest, and, and, you know, and we're trying to be, you know, live off the grid. So, do you recall where you were at when, uh, yeah, I'm sure you do, when Kennedy got shot? When JFK or yeah John yeah yeah I was I was uh, working in a in an electronics plant in uh, in Columbus Nebraska and uh, well that's a long ways from Long Beach isn't it it's a long yeah oh man yeah, I, not just in miles my, yeah my my parents moved to uh, we moved from Long Beach to uh, Columbus Nebraska the year I started high school. I didn't even know there was such a place as Columbus, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural shock. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I haven't been to any of my reunions, Doug, on it. But uh, uh, yeah, so I was, uh, and I was just 21 uh, at that time, and I went to the. Um, they announced it at work, and and so they over the loudspeakers, and and we were just, you know. In shock. Oh yeah, it was shocking, shocking time. Yeah, I was selling floor covering in Flint, Michigan. You know when that happened, it was like it's one of those days. If you were alive, then you sure remember what you happened. Sure remember there. where you were when you heard it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I absolutely. went right to the Pawnee Bar and, uh, and you know started drinking whiskey. Seems like I walked across the street to the <laughs> bar and did about the same thing. Uh -huh. You know, there were a lot of things I was thinking I might do, and then I, you know, I'd make a decision. Well, maybe I'd better have a drink first before I do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So you, you, I was in, I was in San Francisco. I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, in I, I went in 1961. I had a two-year enlistment, and uh, you know, I so I was up around Long Beach, and uh, I went through, you know, Pendleton and San Diego, and then I went aboard USS Midway up out of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But I was there. You know, three, four, five years before, you know, everything really started popping there as far as the hippie thing was mm -hmm. was concerned. But at the same time, Mark, I, you know, I, I felt I was really out of place. I, you know, the Marine Corps shaves your head, off, your hair off. I looked like a cue ball with a nose, mm -hmm. and everybody still had long hair even during those days. But mm -hmm. so you're you you caught Haight Ashbury in about '67, right? Right. The, was the summer of love. Yeah, yeah I, you. I mean, you were. Listen, your timing got some of this stuff. Was perfect, timing was perfect. It, the the demonstration that that turned my life around that caused me to drop out, or the, there was well, a turning well, be, point. Be, before you before you go there, t yeah. get, tell me about this guy that you ran into that introduced you or welcomed you to hate Asbury. Yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah, I, I took off out of Costa Mesa hitchhiking on July fourth. Uh, 1967. It took me, it took me about two and a half days to get to San Francisco from, you know, from Newport Beach, essentially. We must have been having a good time because that's a short distance. Yeah, yeah. It's well, people would drive by and give you the finger and yell at you, and goddamn hippie, and you know the. Oh, I got you. The whole thing. I, I had my army draft, my uh, my army discharge papers in my pocket, and you know, people would yell draft dodger, and, and I would take my discharge out. I, I've got an honorable discharge, you jerk. And anyway, the first day I hit San Francisco, coming from San Jose was my last ride. And uh, I was walking up Haight Street, and this must have been you know, July 6th, something like that, 67. And a, a, a guy approached me. He was coming down Haight. I was walking uphill. And he was walking downhill, and we were both on the same sidewalk. And he looked like he was my age, about my my size, kind of, you know, same kind of hair, same kind of beard. Not, we didn't look like clones or doppelgangers or anything right. like that. But he looked similar. 
and he stuck out his hand and he says, "Welcome to San Francisco, Mark." And I, I got scared. I'll bet that'll yeah, blow I did. you. I did. I took his, you know, I shook his hand, and I, you know, I thought maybe maybe I knew him from L.A. or from from Orange County or something. And I I said, "Do I know you?" And he says. He said, my brother and I were doing some acid, and we saw, we saw you in the clouds, huh. in the cloud formation. And, you know, and then that didn't make me feel any more comfortable at all. But this guy took me all up and down Haight Street and showed me where to, you know, where to, where to crash, where to get, get food cheap, and where to do your laundry. And, you know, he showed me around and then just, you know, had to disappear. So, so, what do you think? There's a higher power at work in all of that. Well, I sure think so. I, I think we're, you know, yeah. looking back at, you know, at that time, you don't, you don't really, or I, I didn't really think about synchronicity and, no. and you know, and and uh, destiny and fate and karma and all those things. I, you know, I was, I was still. You know, I hadn't really developed a philosophy or anything. I was just, I was just out there. You know, like, you know, right. hanging out in space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just having a good time with the the, the, the drugs, the alcohol, and the and the party. You, the San Francisco impressed me so heavily that the whole time I was in the city, I didn't do, I didn't even smoke a joint. Really. I was I was so freaked out by by how you know how far these hippies were from from us Orange County hippies you know they were they they were really kind of freaky wow compared compared to where uh, and there was a lot of speed going on already there so a lot of methamphetamine had hit the Haight Ashbury so well you brought back a few memories for me the first time I smoked a joint was in 1962 at the at, at Hollywood and Vine. I'll be darned. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I, you know, like when when we grew up in the 50s, I don't know about where you were at, but I only ran into the idea of marijuana through my, my best friend who was a musician. He played guitar, and he yeah. his teacher was in a country western band in a, a big joint called the Wagon Wheel, and they did, you know, smoke. But uh, and I didn't, it didn't, you know, didn't make any sense to me at that time. They warned us about drugs in the in the mid fifties in, uh, really? in Long Beach, and they gave us a little lecture on drugs. And at that time, there were there were gangs. There were, there was one huge gang in particular that, that was called the Pachuco. I ran into that when I was out there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the Pachuco smoke. They smoke pot, and we were we were told all about the the nicknames for it and every reefer and all that. And we were told to stay away from it, and if anybody offers it to us. But but uh, I never saw any of it un- until I until '64. That's when I uh, that's when I started getting loaded. Also, my best friend, who was a, a mu- musician, folk singer, guitar player. Well, it was a musician's drug then, you know. You know, the yeah. first time I really heard anything about uh, dr- drugs was you remember Frank Sinatra did a film called Man with a Golden Arm. Right. And that was, and I when I saw it, I don't think I understood even then that much about it, really. Right. But that that was pretty Me powerful. Too. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, you know, we're so 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 close in age. I I just you know when I was reading your book, I I have to tell you, I was a bit jealous of some of the places you were that I I, I had wished I had been. So it was it was a, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Uh, you and I also have have uh, a teacher uh, of the same, you know, that uh, Yogananda, uh, autobiography of a, a yoga. That was one of, you know, like one of my powerful uh, experiences. I, I, I didn't get to, I got to the center out there, but I didn't, I didn't do any studying with the people. What, uh, what was your experience with, uh, with that, with the group? Well, there, they had a, a, uh, you know, a big center. At, in uh, in LA, a uh, a retreat or a um, uh, a lake shrine in Pacific Palisades, right? And a and a little church at that time in Fullerton, California, which is in Orange County. And when I first started having these mystical experiences, the first the first book I I got that mentioned yoga was Autobiography of a Yogi. 
Right. And I read that thing, and I got this. When I read about Yogananda experiencing cosmic consciousness, it described my experience to the T. Yeah, you must have felt like you just got home. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. so cozy. It, so I went to the Fullerton Church, and this is in the in the very big. This is around the time of the Big Eye and the Desert Experience. Right. And I and I said, what's you know? I asked one of the monks. I said, what's what's this Om? And he said, who told you about Om? And I and I said, well, I heard it in my head out in the desert. And, uh, and he said, well, that's a you know that's a sacred word. It's Sanskrit word. Yeah, Sanskrit word. And and um, and you know some people chant chant that word. And so I, I stuck around self-realization for a while, and I took the lessons, and I, I went to the meditations. I took it right up to the Kriya initiation. Did you? Yeah, but I did not take the Kriya initiation. Right. You know, it's very powerful stuff. You know, there, there are a few teachers or books. You know, a lot of my teachers were, you know, I couldn't get to really good teachers, so it was through books that I would, I would find, the, you know, the best ones. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was that was a really a powerful experience for me. You 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 make a statement in the book which I thought was pretty uh, pretty interesting. And it tells a bit about your time in the vanguard of the age of Aquarius. Oh, yeah, that's what that's what we we thought we were. We, that's that's probably in the part where we're we're going. To, we we leave Orange County and yeah, you head LA north and and go to. Uh, and go to Oregon and drop out, and that—that's what we—that's what we thought we were. There was—we didn't have any any guides. We didn't have anybody who had gone before us. You know, in, in the in the sixties, that we were it. Absolutely, absolutely, we were it. And you know, operating in a you know a multi-dimensional world of of psychedelics. Well, uh, yeah, and, and the Beatles at that time were just bringing the East into the West, you know, right, with the Maharishi, right. and yeah. That's that's right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. George Harrison especially. Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah. yeah. So while you were up uh, in in uh, in, excuse me, you were in Northern California, right? No, we were in Southern yeah. Oregon. We were right over the. Right over the the California Oregon border, border in in Oregon, near the nearest town was a place called Cave Junction. So we were like sort of in the edge of the Siskiyou National Forest, and and that's where we we bought some land and gorgeous country up yeah, there. Yeah, it is beautiful country. Yeah, gorgeous country. Yeah. I got up as far as the as the redwoods, and I just was said some amazing stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. So you, while you were up there, you had kind of an encounter with with Charlie Manson. No, not not Manson. Not he. Was Manson that later? Was, he was doing his thing down here, but we we ran into a similar family. Right. Yeah. That uh, that was that was a scary experience too. They, they're at that time there were all kinds of people that that were drifting out of out of Oakland and San, San Francisco and, and, uh, and L.A. and Hollywood and, and, you know, and doing the same things we were. But at least our, you know, our motives were, we, we told ourselves our motives were pure. Most of us were vegetarians. We, we practiced yoga. We didn't, we didn't want to hurt people. We, we weren't on power trips. We weren't on, uh, you know, t- trying to get authority of any kind. Right. And but there were people who you know we we used to think that it, you know if if everybody in the world would take acid it it would solve all of the world's problems. Not so, but, huh? What I learned real quick was if a psychopath takes acid, he's a psychopath on acid. Well, yeah, yeah, and compounded. Yeah. Up yeah. to the tenth power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. So that I learned that out up there in Oregon. That, yeah, yeah, because we ran into some psychopaths, and uh, and they were very very scary. Well, I guess, I think the thing I, that you did with with Manson had something to do with astrology, didn't it? What, what that's, was that? That's right. Yeah. After uh, after the Oregon uh, after our commune fell apart because we couldn't. Uh, with everybody stoned, we didn't have one uniting philosophy or 
or uh, it was just let's get naked and run around the forest and we'll pretend we're going to build some houses and then nothing ever happened you know a lot of the things they say about drugs are true you know yeah yeah <laughs> and, and so we we came back to uh, to California during the Manson trial and uh, and I got into a class because everybody in Oregon, all the people in the commune, were into astrology. Right. And I'm born between two signs, and so when they'd ask me, you know, what sign are you, man, I, I didn't know. I would say some books say I'm Cancer, and some books say I'm Leo, uh -huh. I'm born on July 23rd. And so, but I didn't, I thought astrology was kind of for, you know, little old ladies or something. I, I, right. didn't, I, I didn't even pay any attention to it. But it was so popular among the hippies that I thought, well, at least I better know what sign I am. So I took some classes in Newport Beach. I actually took 15 weeks of classes wow. on, on just how to set up a chart, just do, to do the mathematics without a computer. Right. And you know, the, the, the logarithm big, big tables and all that. The big ephemeris, which is about... The big what, ephemeris, yeah. the big table of houses. Right. Exactly. And uh, and so the Manson trial was going on, and, and in the class, we were looking for charts of celebrities. You know, we did Mia Farrow's chart, and we were looking for celebrities. And I, one of my drinking buddies, he would do anything. And I said, what, Jerry, why don't you... Why don't you go up to the Manson trial and and sit in and see if you can get Charlie's uh, birthday, his, his time of birth? And he he did that. And so he went up to the he went up to the Manson trial and and he asked Manson's lawyer if if he could uh, get Charlie Manson's uh, date, time, and place of birth. And the lawyer went up and asked ask Manson, and Manson says, who wants to know? And Jerry and Manson made eye contact, and, and Manson gave him the, the, you know, the time of birth and the time, date, and place of birth. And the judge, Judge Older, picked up on all of this, this communication that was going on non-verbally between my friend Jerry and Charles Manson. And so when the, when the trial was over for that day, they piled on Jerry and drug him into a little room and ask him, you know, what what's going on here. That's that's a pretty amazing story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they told him never come back again. So so Man and Manson's uh, chart showed that he, you know, like had the the the, the opportunity to be his charismatic guy and either be really evil or really a uh, healer. Is that? Even, yeah. Even my teacher couldn't couldn't tell from looking at the chart. You know which way he was going to use which way he was going to use his you know charismatic his power his magnetism he, right he could he could have been a great preacher he could have been uh, you know kind of a working class Billy Graham you know for instance he or he you know he could have been the Scorpion or the Phoenix well you know and, and he was certainly able to get the attention and captivate the press uh, mm -hmm. you know even though it was from the dark side and yeah I, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, and there are a lot of dark people out there uh, who do a lot of bad things who don't have that capability or anything close right, to that. Right, right. He had a very powerful chart. It, it showed in the chart, but it didn't, it, at least my teacher couldn't, couldn't read it. Right, right. So you, you, got, you got involved with, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't catch this, personally get involved in this part of it, and I find it very interesting. You got involved with the October League. Tell, tell us a bit about that uh, are you, are you still involved there, or? Oh no, no. Yeah, I, yeah they they kicked me out for being drunk uh, <laughs> at uh, International Women's Day. Uh, oh, must have been 1977, probably. So, so what I what I get was that that. Uh, you know, you were disappointed with the Democrats and the Republicans and, you know, the system that we had going on and still have going on and we're trying to find a, a better way? Yeah, I just kept going farther and farther to the left. I, uh, you know, I, I, I just didn't even, I didn't even stop at, at the Democrats and the Republicans and the Peace and Freedom Party and, and all that. I, I didn't even pay any attention to them. I, w I went right from 
from Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I, I went to a convention with with those guys, and I, I saw some, you know, some guys looking like Che Guevara. They had red stars, and they were Vietnam veterans, and they, you know, they were all handy with guns. And and I said, you know, I asked one of the guys, I said, well, you know, what group do these guys come from? And they said well, they're from the Venceremos Brigade, which is a Cuban-based outfit. And so I joined the Venceremos Brigade because I thought they were cool. And then I and then I found out that, of course, you know, if I'd have paid any attention, you know, that the Venceremos Brigade you know, coming out of Cuba, which at that time was under the thumb of the Soviet Union. Right. So here, you know, here I was looking at Castro and and Che Guevara, you know, all, you know, like romantic hero heroes, worship, Robin right? Robin Hood kind of guys. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I just, I, that's how I wanted to see him. Sure. But I knew that the Soviet Union was an oppressive, you know, horrible you know, they had a horrible thing going on. Right. So when I when I put it together that the that the Soviet Union was was actually was actually running the show and, and tr- trickling down into the Vince Ramos Brigade, I got out of it and I and I went Maoist. I, I thought the Chinese way was uh, was better, and and the October League was Chinese based. It was a it was a Maoist group. And the I got in on the October League as as they were forming a new party called the Communist Party Marxist Leninist. Right, right. And uh, you know I became a part of that uh, for a while, and then and then I got I got disillusioned with that because they for for one thing they didn't believe in a higher power, and and for another I could see that this was it was nuts. You know, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, well, you know, you know, Mark. I, I, we, we, I think we have the same problem today. You know, we, we, you look around and you, you, you start to realize that that capitalism is reaching a point where it no longer works, and, and it's it's kind of destroys uh, democracy, and 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 you, you know, you look around and there's there's nothing on the you know, there's nothing to view that really replaces that and you wonder where do we go from here well one of the things i learned be, you know from from being the, as far left of a communist as you can be which was which was uh, you know mao zedong thought marxist leninist mao zedong thought right when it, when i when i got out of that and you know i i just decided that i'm not going to i have my opinion right but but I'm not talking politics anymore. I don't blame you. Yeah, yeah, because all during everything that I was in, I thought I was right, and I'd get up on a soapbox and I'd tell everybody how you know how capitalism, the natural order, is that it turns into imperialism, and and then the, the natural order of that is 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 armed struggle, and and the and natural result of that is the dictatorship of the proletariat, and and. Now, you know, I don't get into that. I, yeah, I, I actually never really have. I, but the spiritual part of it seems to me that somehow or other that's the solution and that there's a, there's a hand in that that's guiding things that's far above what I'm able to yeah. comprehend. Yeah, we'd, you know? we'd be very miserable living under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Oh, no, no <laughs> we, doubt in my we mind. Couldn't, we couldn't have this conversation. No, not not even close. Matter of fact, this close. no, no, this this mm-hmm. this show would not exist. Nope. So you got you got actually, boy. We, we I tell you what, I've got uh, another hour. We'd, I'd like to talk with you. We're starting to kind of run down time wise here. Uh, uh, you got into recovery. You, you you became a alcoholic addict, I guess, and got into recovery about what. 29 years ago or something mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, 19, uh, 19 December 1981, you know, I, I had an experience, and I, I saw myself as I really was, you know, after, after several DUIs, and, and uh, you know, the, the judge wanted me to go to AA, and I refused, and I went to jail rather than go to AA. <laughs> so, makes so makes sense I, to me. You know, when I hit bottom finally, I, you know, I didn't care. I, you know, I picked up the phone and I, I called the central office, and I went crawling in. And, uh, but what, ha- what happened was, 
you know, I saw myself, I had another experience. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I saw myself as I really was, and I was a, a man in his late 30s dying of alcoholism, and I never put that label on myself. That was the first time I ever used that. I thought, God darn, I'm an alcoholic. Right. That's the whole deal. So, so how has your spirituality changed? You know, from the point that you were, you were looking at uh, in the, you know, the uh, Pacific Palisades, looking at uh, Yogananda's work uh, to today, where you know, how, what effect has the, you know, the recovery had on your spirituality? Well, the the recovery has has given me the, you know, the sobriety and the and the mental emotional and and spiritual yep. yeah and it's it's given me the the ability to to meditate and follow a spiritual path follow my spiritual path you know i always i i think I, from the time i was a little kid i had a devotional nature yeah and when, when getting involved with alcohol and drugs that that kind of warps that well you know the other thing it. the other thing i think happens is that and, and I, you, you basically just said it, and that is that, you know, drugs and alcohol, we bounce around from path to path, looking, searching, seeking, and not able to adopt and stay with one discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for me, that ability to get on a, a discipline and stay with it has had a tremendous effect in my life mm -hmm. compared to, to, where I, to where I was before. S certainly, it, it's brought me... I don't know about you, Mark, but my idea of a higher power or God or whatever you want to call him, her, or it has has morphed in many times and changed. And I, I suspect that that possibility, you know, probably will happen again. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you, I, go I ahead. Hear you, George. You end, yeah, and you end the book uh, w with with what you call the great truth, and and that is the, you, you know your experience of. Uh, uh, tell us that, uh, again about you know you, you, I am the man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I'm I'm just gonna if you don't mind, I'll just read that last that last chapter. Cause we we got about a minute and a half left. Okay. And okay. Go, 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 go. My denial is li okay. I was I was always in the in, throughout the book. I'm always complaining about the man. Right. The man represents authority. Right. Okay. When I got sober and got into being an alcohol and drug counselor, I, you know, I got involved with, with working with probation, with, with domestic violence. I got, I got to see the other side, the law enforcement side. I got to relate to him. I got to have compassion for him. I got to really identify with him and get him. And so at, at the end, I, I say something like, you know, my denial has lifted. Huh. I've experienced the great truth. I am the man. I am the man. I am the man. Yeah. Listen, Mark, you are the man. You are a good <laughs> guy. You're a good guy. I'm looking Thank forward you. to having a cup of coffee with you one of these Absolutely. days. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. You have all my information, I think. If not, I'll email it to yeah, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to keep contact going here. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, great, George. I'll tell you what, we're, we're totally out of time, so I'm going to have to say goodbye, but, uh, but we will talk. Listen, I'm going to send you the code also for the interview. If you can put it up on your website or whatever, do whatever you want if that interests you. Great. All I right. Will. Sounds good. And uh, thank you for taking an hour out of your day and spending it with me. I've, I've had a good time with you. It's my pleasure, and I'm honored, George. I'm honored. You have a good night, my friend. Uh, okay. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Good guy, Tom. Yeah, I, yeah, I read his book, and I just was, you know, I just, he, he made me laugh a lot about some pretty serious things. So if you're, if you're looking for a good read, and it's not a hard read, it's, a, he's, it's, and it's well written, Orange Sunshine. So remember, I've got a great guest next week, uh, Steve McAllister, author of The McAllister Code. Be sure and come back. In the meantime, don't forget to accentuate the positive and have a fantastic week.